hello everyone who have joined us via zoom and youtube for this important and interesting session we are glad to welcome dr santosh sir to our white army channel who is an excellent teacher by profession and passion he has his own youtube channel named dr santosh anatomy tutorials which is basically teaches uh, anatomy for all including medical nursing dental and paramedical students in a very effective manner using innovative softwares 3d models powerpoints and explanatory videos link of which is given in the description box check it out and uh, without any further ado we can start the session over to you sir thank you ma'am for the better introduction so today we are going to discuss about the anatomy of the dural venous sciences as the name itself suggest sinus means gaps containing the venous blood in the dura mater so we are going to discuss about the dural venous sinus you can have a brief glimpse of the dural venous sinus here as you can see it is surrounding the cerebrum and cerebellum and brain stem that is surrounding the brain and why we should know about this dural venous sinus imagine a patient coming like this this to be one of the signs and symptoms of this dural this cavernous sinus thrombosis which is one of the important dural venous sinus so to understand cavernous sinus and what are the other dural venous sinus in detail let us try to see under following contents first we'll see what is the water dural venous sinuses their characteristic features classification how they are classified into paired dural venous sinuses and paired dural venous sinuses and we'll see cavernous sinus in detail as it is very important sinus because it is surrounded by the uh, around five uh, cranial nerve branches and it also has relation with the internal carotid artery so let's begin what are these dural venous sinuses these are the venous channels present in between the the two layer of dura mater that is outer endosteal and inner meningeal layer and basically they drain brain adjacent cranial bones orbit and parts of the ear specifically the internal ear and as we see when we see the dural folds they compartmentalize the cranial cavity by their different folds there are four dural folds by name fox cerebrae fox means sickle shape which is separating the two cerebral hemisphere it is called as fox cerebrae then there is tentorium cerebellae which separates the cerebrum from cerebellum and there is fox cerebellae which separates the two cerebellar hemispheres and there is one more fold called as diaphragm cellae which which roofs the cella tarsica and contains the it roofs the pituitary gland and in the middle it has a opening for the pituitary stalk so what are the features of these dural venous sinuses they are lined by endothelium as you already know sinus means gaps we have seen sinus valves and all wide diameter capillaries they are lined by endothelium and these dural venous sinuses are devoid of muscular tissue so they don't have any muscle coat or muscle layer for support that's why any damage to dural venous sinuses there will be profuse bleeding because there is no constriction by the muscle as they are devoid of muscular tissue they are valveless means they provide two way communication of the blood so they are valveless and they collect the blood from brain meninges diploe internal and orbit they drain these areas and some dural venous sinuses absorb csf by the arachnoid granulations within them we will discuss that in the further slides and they maintain intracranial pressure because they are connected to the extracranial veins via emissary veins and these emissary veins are also valveless and they connect the extracranial with the veins with the intracranial veins so even though the dural venous sinuses are inside the cranial cavity they are at risk of infection from these emissary veins because of their communications and tributaries so here you can see the dural venous sinuses and you can notice how the dural venous sinuses are present in between the two layers of the dura mater as we already know the three meningeal layers dura mater arachnoid mater and pia mater dura mater divides into outer endosteal and inner meningeal and all the dural venous sinuses present majority of them present between the outer endosteal and inner meningeal except some sinuses we will discuss about that and you can see 
Even you see here, they are also involved in CSF absorption. And you can see the this is a picture of showing picture showing the arachnoid granulations which absorb CSF. They are lined by endothelium. And here you can notice this is how the brain is covered by all these three meningeal layers. And you can see the arachnoid granulations. Arachnid villi, we say, and this is the these are this is the position of dural folds like this. When you specifically isolate the dural folds, you can see a midline fox cerebri, sickle-shaped fold separating the two cerebral hemispheres. It is having a, a pointed anterior end which is attached to the frontal crest of the frontal bone and fistula gallae. As you go posteriorly, it will increase in the width. And it attached to the upper margin of the tentorium cerebelli. Tentorium cerebelli, and in fact, it tends the cerebral hemisphere. So it roofs the the deepest cranial fossa, the posterior cranial fossa of the interior of the cranial cavity, and separates the occipital lobes from the cerebellar hemispheres. This will attach that, and from the lower margin of tentorium, you will see one more midline fold, sickle shaped. Separating the two cerebral hemispheres, cerebellar hemispheres, incompletely. That is the fox cerebelli, and anteriorly above the cerebellum you will see diaphragm cerebellum. So you can notice here this is the fox cerebellum, tentorium cerebellum, and there will be midline fox cerebellum at the internal occipital crest. And This is the plan of the different dural venous sinuses. How they are classified and all, we'll see that. Okay, so this is the entire dura mater with the in, in, inward extensions called as dural folds. And coming to the classification, how they are classified? They are depending upon the number of the dural venous sinuses. They are classified into unpaired and paired. There are seven unpaired dural venous sinuses which are in the mid sagittal. they are in the median plane if you observe all unpaired sinuses are in the median plane namely superior sagittal inferior sagittal straight sinus occipital sinus basilar venous plexus anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus and there are paired dural venous sinuses which are mostly running along the the uh, bony part extending from the interoccipital protuberance there will be transverse sinus sigmoid sinus in the sigmoid sulcus which is in the posterior part of the petrous bone then there is petrous squamous sinus superior and inferior petrous sinus uh, along the respective borders of the petrous bone cavernous sinus in the middle cranial fossa on either side of the body of sphenoid middle meningeal sinus in the floor of the middle cranial fossa in the lateral part spino parietal sinus at junction between anterior and middle cranial fossa we will see them again so once we see in this animation so when you are seeing from above the dura mater is completely covering the cerebral hemisphere cerebellar hemispheres and brain stem so you can see but in in some places they are sending the inward projections called as dural folds so once you see that once you take out this the outer layer you can see the this this is a superior sagittal sinus this is superior sagittal sinus present in the midline along the upper margin of the fox cerebri so once you isolate here you can see this is the view of the dural venous sinuses this is how you will observe the dural venous sinuses you can see here superior sagittal sinus inferior sagittal sinus and where fox cerebri meets tentorium cerebelli here you will see straight sinus straight sinus will continue as the left transverse sinus where superior sagittal will continue as the right transverse sinus transverse sinus will continue as sigmoid sinus sigmoid sinus eventually continue as internal jugular vein then you will see pair of superior petrosal and inferior petrosal sinus here you can notice that that is straight sinus the arrow is showing superior sagittal sinus will continue as right transverse sinus whereas here you can see there is a midline basilar venous plexus over the clavus and anterior and posterior intercavernous form a ring around the pituitary stalk in the diaphragma cellai so all these dural venous sinuses are present within the layers of dura mater 
namely outer endosteal and inner meningeal except the inferior sagittal sinus and straight sinus which are present only in the meningeal layer you can notice there that, that is the these are communications that is cavernous sinus important sinus then there is spino parietal sinus so this is how you will see the different dural venous sinuses and in this video when you see here let us try to see the paired dural venous sinuses i told you all the unpaired dural venous sinuses are in the mid sagittal plane they are in the median plane of the cranial cavity whereas the paired dural venous sinuses are on the sides you don't require any mnemonic to remember these things just start from with your knowledge of osteology of interior of cranium start from internal occipital protuberance you are getting transverse sulcus so transverse sinus is there this transverse sinus will meet the petrous bone there there will be petrous bone in the part of temporal bone so petrous squamous sinus will be there and there will be sigmoid sulcus containing sigmoid sinus then you will see the petrous bone having a superior border and inferior border lodging the superior and inferior petrous sinus respectively and as you go to the middle cranial fossa on either side of body of spinoid you will see cavernous sinus and cavernous sinus you will see between below the lesser wing of spinoid there will be spino parietal sinus and there will be middle meningeal sinus that you see in the lateral part of middle cranial fossa so once you trace there starting transverse sinus then sigmoid sinus at junction you will see petrous squamous then along the petrous bone there you can see the petrous bone temporal bone along the superior border superior petrous sinus along the inferior border inferior petrous sinus and on either side of body of spinoid cella tarsica cavernous sinus and you can see beneath the lesser wing of spinoid you are seeing spino parietal sinus one which is not visible here middle meningeal sinus which we didn't isolate here so that will be there in the lateral part of the middle cranial fossa so this is how the dural venous sinus are there in the cranial cavity you can see superior sagittal that is inferior sagittal inferior sagittal continues straight sinus that you can see straight sinus straight sinus usually continues the left hand sinus that is higher to the occipital then you can see basilar venous plexus over the clivus in front of the brain stem and you can notice there anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus both are forming a ring there so these are all unpaired dural venous sinuses present in the midline and let us try to see them along with the dural folds so once we remove the layers one by one dura mater recta mater and pia mater and we will remove one cerebral hemisphere to understand you can see fox cerebrae is there which is lodged in the median longitudinal fissure between the two cerebral hemispheres and even so i said and see yeah this is the view with the dural folds dural venous sinuses with the dural folds we can notice this is the fox cerebrae along the superior margin you are seeing superior sagittal sinus along the inferior margin in the posterior two third of the inferior margin of the fox cerebrae you are seeing inferior sagittal sinus lodging there and this inferior sagittal sinus will continue as which sinus there straight sinus at a junction between the fox cerebrae and tentorium cerebellae along this junction straight sinus and straight sinus will continue as left transverse sinus superior sagittal sinus will continue as right transverse sinus and you can notice there the transverse sinus continues sigmoid sinus and along the superior border of superior border of the petrous temporal bone superior petrous sinus inferior petrosal sinus along the inferior border and on either side of sagittal sinus cavernous sinus so this is how the dural venous sinus are incorporated in the dural folds that is spino parietal sinus which is highlighted and you can notice there and along this you can see there is fox cerebellae which is incompletely separating two cerebellar hemispheres along this margin here you will see occipital sinus 
that is basilar venous plexus over the clavus and that is anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus so this is how the dural venous sinus are arranged as paired and unpaired in the different dural folds so coming to the unpaired dural venous sinus first we will see the superior sagittal sinus as i already told that all the unpaired sinus are present in the midline superior sagittal inferior sagittal straight sinus occipital sinus basilar venous plexus anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus coming to the superior sagittal sinus where it is present it is lies in the it lies in the superior convex margin of the fox cerebri it begins at crista galli which is a part of ethmoid bone it passes backwards and gradually increases in the size triangular in cross section and it ends at the internal occipital protuberance which we also call a, call as torcula cerophili as a, as it is discovered by the the old father of anatomy here there will be confluence of sinuses superior sagittal sinus right and left transverse sinus occipital sinus and straight sinuses will meet there so internal occipital protuberance is a common point of meeting of different dural venous sinuses and a potentially uh, mcq point high yielding point so they may ask you all of the following sinuses meet at the internal occipital protuberance except so what are the dural venous sinuses meeting there superior sagittal sinus straight sinus right and left transverse sinus and occipital sinus these five sinuses meet there so you can notice there confluence of sinus will be here superior sagittal sinus straight sinus right and left transverse sinus and occipital sinus so superior sagittal sinus interior you will see opening of superior cerebral veins as they are draining the the superior lateral surface of the brain and it contains fibrous bands and arachnoid granulations for the absorption of csf and presents many venous lacunae within the interior as you can see here the superior sagittal sinus i can see here you can see arachnoid granulations and these arachnoid granulations form a, a fovea in the bone that we called as a fovea granular granular pits in the calvary of the skull as you can notice here you can see here will be the superior sagittal sinus with arachnoid granulations they absorb csf so cut the tributaries what are the tributaries as we already seen the superior cerebral veins diploic and emissary veins are there emissary veins connect the superior sagittal sinus uh, sinus uh, with the parietal veins there will be parietal foramina and the kind of the veins of scalp veins of nose via foramen cecum present within the frontal crest and crest gallic -like in the intercranial fossa then also connect with the cavernous sinus via superficial middle cerebral vein and superior anastomotic vein that we will see so let us try to see superior sagittal sinus here so once you see superior sagittal sinus it is present in the the upper convex margin of the fox cerebri you can see these are the venous lacunae there on either side and is draining all these superior cerebral veins draining the superolateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere and this is the superficial middle cerebral vein present in the sulcus there lateral sulcus and it communicates with the cavernous sinus it begins at the crista galli and ends at the internal occipital protuberance so like the fox cerebri it increases in the width as it goes posteriorly so it communicates with the veins of scalp so any infection of the, um, the scalp may may spread to superior sagittal sinus causing thrombosis and resulting in decreased absorption of csf because it is involved with the absorption of csf via arachnoid granulations next coming to the inferior sagittal sinus inferior sagittal sinus is peculiar because it doesn't have contact with the bone so it is purely present in the meningeal layer of the dura mater so it lies in the posterior two third of the the inferior margin of the fox cerebri 
it drains the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere remember superior cerebral sinus drains the suprolateral surface whereas the inferior cerebral sinus drains the most of the medial surface of the cerebral hemispheres and opens into straight sinus it opens into straight sinus you can see inferior cerebral sinus is in the lower margin of the lower free margin having the meningeal layer lower free margin of the fox cerebrae and continue as straight sinus both these inferior cerebral sinus and straight sinus are present in the meningeal layer of dura mater whereas all the other dural venous sinus are present in the endosteal outer endosteal and inner meningeal layers coming to the straight sinus it is lying in the junction between the fox cerebrae and tetrarum cerebelli it is continuing as a left transverse sinus at what point internal occipital protuberance also known as what confluence of sinuses and it drains the inferior cerebral sinus superior cerebellar veins because it is present at junction tetrarum cerebelli and a great cerebral vein of galen which is formed by the two internal cerebral veins which drain the deeper parts of the cerebral cortex you can see that superior cerebral sinus inferior cerebral sinus continuing a straight sinus and this is the confluence of sinuses where superior cerebral straight sinus left and right transverse sinus meeting along with the occipital sinus 1 2 3 4 five sinuses are meeting at that point so let us see in the animation how these inferior cerebral and straight sinus are oriented we are taking one one half here if you see the right lateral view that is the inferior margin of the dural fold fox cerebrae this is straight sinus it's a contraction of which sinus inferior sagittal which is present in the posterior two third of the inferior margin of fox cerebrae and it continues as left transverse sinus the straight sinus is continuing as left transverse sinus so inferior cerebral sinus drains the medial surface of the cerebral hemispheres whereas straight sinus drains the this cerebral vein of galen that is the cerebral vein of galen formed by the two internal cerebral veins there you can notice once you isolate here yes so like this two internal cerebral veins and thalamus striate veins there they are forming the cerebral vein of galen which is draining into straight sinus so you can notice there it is draining this thalamus striate veins and uh, these cerebral internal cerebral veins they drain the thalamus and uh, deep part of the cerebral cortex that is how you see in fresatal and straight sinus occipital sinus as the name itself suggest it is running along the internal occipital crest lies in the posterior margin of the fox cerebelli and it it also terminates at confluence of sinuses it is the smallest sinus you can notice there it is this is the occipital sinus present in the posterior margin of fox cerebelli let us see that in the animation so here you can notice this is the occipital sinus there this is the occipital sinus you can notice it is having communication with the transverse sinus there it is also draining this marginal sinuses and it has communication with the vertebral venous plexus there these are marginal sinuses which surround the foram margins of foramina magnum and there you can see it is having communication with the vertebral venous plexus so occipital sinus is closely related to cerebellum it is communicated with the basilar venous plexus via marginal sinus and also has communication with the vertebral venous plexus coming to the anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus they lie in the diaphragm of the leg and they form a ring of sinuses and they communicate the right and left cavernous sinuses we can notice there anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus they surround the pituitary stalk basilar venous plexus as it is present in the over the clavus where basi spinoid and basi occiput 
neat and there will be basilar artery which is formed by the right and left uh, vertebral arteries it lies over the clavus it connects the the right and left inferior petrosal sinus and connect below with the internal vertebral venous plexus along with occipital sinus so you can see these are anterior and posterior intracavernous sinus and here will be basilar venous plexus so that is about the unpaired dural venous sinuses next coming to the paired dural venous sinuses so we discuss excuse me sir yes your uh, video is stuck sir okay on your video yeah no ma'am yes Ma'am, I'm clicking. It is not. Hello. Yeah, sir. I can see. Okay. Now it is visible, ma'am. No, sir. Yes. Now it may be visible. Now, ma'am. No. no, sir. I can see. No, ma'am. Yeah, your screen is visible. Sir. Okay, okay, okay. Now the PPT is visible, ma'am. Yes, sir. PPT is visible. Shall I continue, ma'am? Yes, sir. You can. Okay, thank you. So now coming to the paired dural venous sinuses. So coming to the most important sinus amongst the paired dural venous sinuses, it is important because of its location and relations. with the surrounding nerves so cavernous sinuses the cavernous sinus is a paired dural venous sinuses present on either side of the body of sphenoid and extends from the superficially apex of the petrous temporal bone measuring around 2 cm in length and 1 cm in breadth as you can see here cavernous sinus is present on either side of body of sphenoid containing the cella tarsica You can notice here. If you take a look here, the rear view, or you can see panoramic view of the interior of the skull with the brain removed. You can see left and right cavernous sinus present on either side of the body of sphenoid in the middle cranial fossa. And if you take a this coronal section of the cavernous sinus, you can see it is related to one big artery, one nerve there, and there are four nerves in the lateral wall. and it is related to the uncus of the temporal lobe as middle cranial fossa lodges the temporal lobe of the cerebral hemispheres so that's why it is very very important it is related to the optic chiasma pituitary gland sphenoid sinus so per se cavernous sinus is not important it is important because of its relations so it is highly influential dural venous sinus you can say because of its relations close relation with the important cranial nerve which supply the extraocular muscles and there is one master endocrine gland there is a crossing of uh, optic nerve fibers optic chiasma there so let us see that how it is formed like all the other dural venous sinuses it is formed by separation of meningeal and endosteal layer the roof and lateral wall is formed by the meningeal layer whereas the floor and medial wall which is bony formed by the endosteal layers you can see there the roof and lateral wall is formed by the meningeal layer whereas the medial wall and floor is formed by the endosteal layer separation of the meningeal and endosteal layers of the dura mater and structures passing through it see when we say cavernous the meaning of cavernous is spongy trabecular it is most significant feature in cadaveric cavernous sinus but when you see in the living you will see the spongy appearance in the peripheral part and beneath the pass the structure passing through the cavernous sinus are internal cavitary artery and abducens nerve the internal cavitary artery is 
surrounded by the cerebral plexus of nerves and veins there and you can see abducens nerve infralateral to the internal pituitary artery you can notice there through the sinus you can see and they are separated from this venous blood via endothelium as we already discussed the dural venous sinus are lined by endothelium and even in the lateral wall all these nerves are separated from the this venous blood by via the endothelium they are in the lateral wall and these two structures are going through it internal pituitary artery infralateral to it there is abducens nerve so essentially all the nerves supplying the extraocular muscles are related to it so in the lateral wall namely you can remember as moto from below upwards maxillary nerve ophthalmic nerve trochlear nerve and oculomotor nerve maxillary nerve and ophthalmic nerves are the divisions of the trigeminal nerve which are sensory oculomotor and trochlear they are the motor nerves supplying the most of the extraocular muscles trochlear nerve supplies the superior oblique oculomotor nerve supplies all the extraocular muscles except the lateral rectus supplied by the abducens nerve and the superior oblique supplied by trochlear nerve you can notice there in the lateral wall from below upwards maxillary nerve ophthalmic nerve trochlear which is the thinnest cranial nerve there and oculomotor and by via passing this through this lateral wall they are gaining access to the orbit via passing to the superior orbital fissure the maxillary nerve will enter through the foramen rotundum and enters the this uh, pterygopalatine fossa whereas ophthalmic division it will divide into nasal mesociliary frontal and lacrimal branches oculomotor and trochlear they pass through the superior orbital fissure to enter the orbit coming to the relations here as we discussed it has important relations medially what you will see you will see body of spinoid with spinoid sinus and pituitary gland pituitary gland <coughs> laterally cavum trigeminal and anchor of the temporal lobe superiorly you will see optic chiasma and internal cavity artery the internal cavity artery will form a s shaped siphon it will pass through the sinus then it will then it will move vertically upwards like a hissing cobra it will move that is we call it as cavity siphon it will enter between the anterior cranial process and middle cranial process and then it gives terminal branches so you can notice here the internal cavity artery is passing and then it will move vertically by passing by piercing to the roof between the anterior cranial process and the middle cranial process anterior cranial process is a part of lesser wing of spinoid which gives attachment to the the free margin of tentorium cerebellae this is a tentorium cerebellae are you seeing here tentorium cerebellae the free margin will go attached to anterior cranial process whereas middle cranial process will be here which is the uh, which is present on the either side of tuberculum cellae tuberculum cellae will be here in the posterior part of sulcus chiasmaticus between them the internal cavity artery is emerging and usually it is held by a carotidoclinoid ligament which attaches anterior cranial process to the middle cranial process coming to the tributaries tributaries of the cavernous sinus how the infection can spread because it receives the blood from superior ophthalmic vein inferior ophthalmic vein and central vena fidena coming from the orbit superficial middle cerebral vein it will drain the brain the process of the brain inferior cerebral vein which uh, drain the inferior surface of the cerebral hemisphere spinoparietal sinus which it drains the orbit and uh, spinoid sinuses and anterior trunk of middle meningeal sinuses these are the different tributaries of the cavernous sinus once you see here you can see superior ophthalmic vein inferior ophthalmic vein central vena fidena there they all are coming these three veins are coming from the orbit and they are having the the way of distribution from the orbit and and connecting with the cavernous sinus there and coming to the communications important communications see this cavernous sinus being the important sinus it has a lot of communications with other sinuses and important veins with the transverse sinus of course by a superior petrosus sinus 
with the intrans jugular vein via inferior pectoral sinus with the pterygoid venous plexus via emissary veins passing through foramen oval if you remember foramen oval the structures passing through foramen oval we remember as male mandibular nerve axillary meningeal artery lesser pectoral nerve and emissary veins the emissary veins connect emissary veins passing through foramen oval connect cavernous sinus with the pterygoid venous plexus here like this here will be the this pterygoid venous plexus will be there via passing through the foramen oval then it communicates with the opposite cavernous sinus why already discussed anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus so infection from one cavernous sinus may spread to other cavernous sinus if the proper treatment or measures are not taken and it communicates the facial vein via superior ophthalmic vein so any infection from the dangerous area of face may spread to cavernous sinus and it it communicates the superior cerebral sinus via superficial middle cerebral vein and superior anastomotic vein of prolard so you can in this picture you can notice the three the three tributaries from the orbit namely superior ophthalmic vein inferior ophthalmic vein and central infodema and which ophthalmic vein communicates facial vein the avers superior ophthalmic vein and there are two coming from the meninges that is other sinus spinoparietal sinus and middle meningeal sinus and two coming from the brain superficial middle cerebral vein which is the lateral sulcus and inferior cerebral veins and it has a communication with the the opposite sinus via anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus and coming to the the communications it communicates with the the facial via superior ophthalmic vein to the uh, what you can say transverse sinus via superior petrosal intrajugular vein via inferior petrosal it has also communication with the basilar venous plexus so these are the different tributaries and communications which form the important route of spread of infection so you can notice that in this uh, uh, schematic diagram how it is communicated with the different veins and you can notice that the pterygoid venous plexus present in infant emporial fossa via emissary veins passing through which foramina foramina oval foramina oval so let us see the cavernous sinus here in the animation once you see here we are seeing the the entire venous drainage of the interior of the cranium here you can see that is the cavernous sinus present on either side of the the body of spinal bone in the middle cranial fossa on either side of cella tarsica you can see there if you isolate the spinal bone there it is present on either side of this cella tarsica turkish saddle pituitary fossa you can notice there and here we can see this is lesser ring of spinoid this is the anterior clinoid process you can see there the posterior medial sharp margin of lesser ring of spinoid that is anterior clinoid process this is tuberculum cellae the either end of the tuberculum cellae is forming middle clinoid process this is dorsum cellae either end of dorsum cellae is forming posterior clinoid process so between the anterior and middle there is emergence of internal carotid artery we will see that remember that these are the bony landmarks so you can see the cavernous sinus is here in the middle cranial fossa floor of the middle fossa on the sort of body of spinoid this is how it is located and as you go once we, we see the different relations here so once we isolate the nerves and the vessels related to the cavernous sinus that is cavernous sinus that is you can see it is related to four important nerves in the lateral wall supported by the endothelium and medially and above it is related to the optic chiasma pituitary stalk you can see the pituitary gland there in the cella tarsica surrounded by a ring of cavernous sinuses uh, sorry 
intercavernous nerves and in the lateral wall you can see 1 2 3 4 nerves namely from bowels maxillary ophthalmic trochlear and oculomotor these four nerves are there moto m o t o and through the cavernous sinus you will see abducens nerve abducens nerve enters the cavernous sinus by passing beneath the petrospinal ligament and that is the internal carotid artery you can see there it will pass through and it will emerge between anterior clinoid process and middle clinoid process you can see trochlear nerve the only cranial nerve coming from the dorsal side is in the is in the lateral relation to the cavernous sinus oculomotor nerve coming from the anterior side of the midbrain oculomotor nerve come from the medial side of the cerebral peduncle and it is related to the lateral wall the oculomotor and trochlear both will be in the oculomotor trigon and how they enter there oculomotor nerve before entering to orbit divides into two divisions that is maxillary division this is ophthalmic division the higher portion is maxillary division it will pass through foramen rotundum so four nerves are related you can notice there this is the superficial middle cerebral vein which is communicated with the cavernous and spinoparietal sinus and there will be the superior ophthalmic vein inferior ophthalmic vein and central nerve vena and intercavernous sinus are related there superior petrosal sinus communicates the cavernous sinus with the transverse sinus that is inferior petrosal sinus communicates cavernous sinus with the interjugular vein and these are the emissary veins communicating the cavernous sinus with the pterygoid venous plexus here by passing through foramina ovale these are pterygoid venous plexus present in the infratemporal fossa so these are the different relations communications and tributaries of the cavernous sinus hope it is clear to you we have seen the diagram in the in the image and in the animation and coming to the the important clinical conditions the cavernous sinus thrombosis so what happens there there will be multiple cranial neuropathies because the uh, oculomotor trochlear and the the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve are related in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus along with the maxillary division also where a sixth nerve is related to the medial side of the cavernous sinus uh, passing along with the internal carotid artery so there will be ophthalmoplegia ophthalmoplegia means paralysis of uh, extraocular muscles there will be painful ophthalmoplegia proptosis ocular and cranial broods congenital congestions and there will be increased intracranial tension optic disc power you can say papillary edema retinal hemorrhage all these are there because it involves the sympathetic plexus surrounding the internal cavity artery there is possibility of horner syndrome also so like this you will see there is engorgement of the these all cavernous sinus communications passing along with the optic nerve and superior ophthalmic inferior ophthalmic vein central nerve fredina you can notice there so what is the treatment of cavernous sinus thrombosis first we should start with the anticoagulation and we have to take the measures so that there will be reduced oculomotor sequelae blindness and uh, motor sequelae and also risk of hypopituitarism so you can see here you can notice there the internal artery angiogram you can see how the internal cavity artery is going and forming a siphon there like a hissing cobra we discussed that it will pierce the roof between anterior and middle canal fossa held by keratoclinoid ligament before branching into terminal branches this is how it shows the cavernous sinus thrombosis and there will be cavernous sinus fistula arteriovenous fistula the internal cavity artery which is maintaining the blood flow through the cavernous sinus one more thing you should remember the blood flow through cavernous sinus is maintained by the pulsations of the internal cavernous artery and if there is any anomalous arteriovenous fistula formation then it will lead to the pulsatile exophthalmos and even we can hear systolic murmurs because of the communication between the arterial blood and venous blood so that is about the cavernous sinus remember friends 
कैवरो साइंस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज ऑफ इट्स रिलेशन बिकॉज ऑफ इट्स रिलेशन नेक्स्ट कमिंग टू द्रांसफर साइनस इट इज लाइंग इन दी पोस्टर मार्जिन ऑफ दरेबल इट एक्सटेंड फ्रॉम दी इंटरनल ऑक्सीबल प्रोटोबंस द पॉइंट एट विच ऑल दाइनस मीट ऑल्सो कॉन्फ्लुएंस ऑफ साइनसिस टिल दी मास्टर एंगल एंड कंटिन्यूस सिग्मर्ड साइनस Transverse sinus with sigmoid sinus together they are called as lateral sinus, and sometimes they may be involved in the infection of the middle ear and internal ear, leading to lateral sinus thrombosis and Grindelwald syndrome. You can notice that transverse sinus is there in the posterior margin of the tentorium cerebelli, and it mainly has these following tributaries: superior and inferior petrosal, superior petrosal sinus. by which it is communicating with the cavernous sinus inferior cerebral veins inferior cerebellar veins because it is in the tentorium cerebelli separating the cerebral and cerebellar hemispheres posterior temporal diploic veins and inferior anastomotic vein of labeck which communicates with the superior cerebral sinus coming to the sigmoid sinus as the name suggests it is sigmoid s shaped present in the posterior part of the petrous temporal bone It's a continuation of transverse sinus and will continue as internal jugular vein, and it is separated from the mastoid antrum by a thin plate of bone and mastoid air cells. This is very important in case of mastoid drilling when we try to approach the middle ear via post-auricular incision, and there will be temporal bone drilling and all. So we should be very careful so that we should not damage sigmoid sinus. Otherwise, there will be torrential bleeding, which will be difficult to control. Why? Because the sigmoid sinus doesn't have muscle layer there so we have to use compression and some gel forms to control the bleeding so basically the surgeon should be aware of this variation sometimes the mastoid antrum uh, will have a very thin plate by which it is separate from the sigmoid sinus it will lead to bleeding so you can see sigmoid sinus the tributaries as it is related to mastoid mastoid hemispheres in condyle hemispheres which surround the condyles occipital condyles cerebellar veins and labyrinthine veins because it is in internal ear internal ear is also called as a labyrinth labyrinthine veins there so let us try to see here you can see the transverse sinus the right transverse sinus is a contraction of suprasacral sinus left is a contraction of the straight sinus as you can notice there it is having a communication with the occipital sinus and some cerebellar veins there as occipital sinus these are some cerebellar veins and it is continuing as sigmoid sinus sigmoid sinus has communicated with labyrinthine veins condylar veins there is a sigmoid sinus these are condylar veins around the forma magnum you can see those are condylar veins labyrinthine veins mastoid emissary veins because over the mastoid process you will see a lot of emissary veins passing to the mastoid foramen so this is about the transverse and sigmoid sinus so that is about the dural venous sinuses so how the question can be asked in the university you know, examination it can be like enumerate the characteristic features of the dural venous sinus and classify dural venous sinuses discuss in detail about the cavernous sinus and their location action relations tributaries and communications which are very important part because they act as the roots of spread of infection along with the upper aspects which we have already discussed so let us see the cavernous sinus how do you say what is the location of the cavernous sinus you have to draw the diagram showing the interior of the cranium where it is divided into three first anterior middle and posterior you can see lesser ring of spinoid sat asica dorsum cellae superior border and inferior border of petrous temporal bone foramen magnum intraoccipital crest transverse sulcus superior orbital fissure and the transverse sinus sigmoid sinus inferior superior petrous sinus cavernous sinus spinoparietal sinus and the middle meningeal sinus this is how we we described the the paired dual venous sinuses present paired are in the midline here we are showing the the classification of the dual venous sinuses superior inferior parietal sinus superior inferior straight occipital sinus basilar venous plexus anterior and posterior cavernous 
sinus. This is how we show the classification of the dual venous sinus and how they are present. Remember, anterior are present in the median plane, mid sagittal plane, whereas the paired are along the the bony parts, starting from internal occipital quarter one till superior orbital fissure. Coming to the location of cavernous sinus, again you draw the diagram showing the the, the interior skull with lateral of spinoid, sciatica, petrous temporal bone, foramen magnum, dorsum cell lake, superior orbital fissure. Yes. Now on either side of the sciatica or body of spinoid in the middle pineal fossa location. Of the cavernous sinus extending from superior orbital fissure to apex of petrous temporal bone. Petrous temporal bone. And coming to the relations here, what are the relations? So relations we should show it in the the coronal section. You can see the pair of spinal sinuses. That is the floor of middle pineal fossa, and we will show this meningeal layer. Yes, this is the pituitary fossa, and here you can see cavernous sinus. Okay, so this is the medial wall and floor formed by the endosteal layer, roof and lateral formed by the meningeal layer. You can see there is a pituitary gland, and there will be optic chiasma, which is related in the lateral wall four nerves. What are the four nerves from below upwards? Motor, maxillary, ophthalmic, trochlear, oculomotor. And in the medial wall and floor, you will see internal carotid artery surrounded by sympathetic plexus of nerves, and infralaterally which nerve? Abducens nerve. Abducens nerve enters the cavernous sinus or dural dura mater via passing below petrous sinus ligament, and it should show cavernous here. And laterally, it should show temporal lobe. He is related temporal lobe. So superiorly, it is related to the supramedially. What you can see, optic chiasma, stalk of pituitary gland. And uh, inframedially, body of spinoid and spinoidal ear sinuses, and uh, laterally you will see uncus of temporal bone, anteriorly superior orbital fissure, posterior apex of temporal bone, with cavum uh, trigeminal, and relations in the lateral wall four nerves, M O T O below upwards, maxillary, ophthalmic, trochlear, oculomotor, and medially through surrounding internal carotid artery surrounded by. Sympathetic plexus of nerves and infralaterally abducens nerve, which enters here by passing beneath petrospinoid ligament. And coming to the communication end, tributaries. Okay, let us draw superior orbital fissure there. Here, dorsum cell lake, petrous bone, apex of the petrous bone, and here on either side you will see cavernous sinus, communicated with the orbit via superior inferior ophthalmic vein. Central vein of retina. This is, and it is middle meningeal sinus. That is, emissary veins communicating there. Okay, superior and inferior petrosal sinus. So you can see the different uh, tributaries are superior ophthalmic vein, inferior ophthalmic vein, central vein of retina, spinal parietal sinus, middle meningeal sinus, and this is super superior petrosal sinus and. And that is superficial middle cerebral vein. Like this, different communications are there. Draining the orbit, the the cerebral surfaces, and it communicates with the transverse sinus via superior petrous sinus, internal jugular vein via inferior petrous sinus, and tergoid venous plexus via emissary veins passing through foramen ovale, and it communicates with the facial vein via superior ophthalmic vein. And it communicates with the opposite veins via anterior and posterior intercavernous sinus. So this is how you should draw the different diagrams depicting the location and extent, relations, and the stress related in the lateral wall and in the inframedial wall of the cavernous sinus. And one diagram to show communications and tributaries. So this is what we expect expect in the examination to have a clear depiction. Under the the required headings, be specific to the question asked. Okay, so with this much discussion, let us see some MCQs here. So first one is the dural venous sinus present in the meningeal layer of dura mater. Which of the following is present in the meningeal layer? Superior sinus, 
infraceral sinus, straight sinus, and occipital sinus. Which one is present in the meningeal layer? Anyone? Okay, unmuted answer. Which one is there in the meningeal layer? Inferior sagittal sinus. One more sinus present in the meningeal layer is straight sinus. Next question. All dural venous sinuses meet at the internal occipital protuberance. Except we discuss this one in detail. Also called as confluence of sinuses, torcular hirophily. Which one is not there? Suprasagittal sinus, infraseagittal sinus, straight sinus, and occipital sinus. Which one is directly not meeting at that point? That is inferior sagittal sinus is not meeting at that point. Okay, uh, one more sinus meeting are there. Pair of transverse sinuses, right and left transverse sinuses. All of the following nerves are related to lateral of the cavernous sinus, except we discuss about this moto. So moto M is not there. So which nerve is there? So what are the nerves related to lateral wall from below upwards? Maxillary, ophthalmic, trochlear, and oculomotor. Obducent is related into the inframedial wall, not the lateral wall. So answer should be obducent nerve. Cavernous sinus communicates with the trigger venous plexus via, which means passing through foramen ovale. Anyone? That is via emissary veins. Yes. On next question, this nerve travels through the cavernous sinus by passing beneath petrospinoid ligament. Which nerve travels through the cavernous sinus? Abducent nerve, isn't it? It lies infralateral to the internal carotid artery. Internal carotid artery forms a carotid siphon there, like a hissing cobra. Okay. The following all communicate directly with the sigmoid sinus, except which one does not have a communication with the sigmoid sinus? Occipital, inferior, transverse, and straight. Answer is the straight sinus. Occipital sinus has a communication with the sigmoid sinus via condylar veins, inferior petrosal sinus via interventricular vein. And transfer sinus itself will continue as sigmoid sinus. Yes. On the question here, with the child birth, an excessive anteroposterior compression of the head may tear the attachment of fox cerebrae from tenterum cerebellae. The bleeding that follows is likely to be from which of the following venous sinuses? So, which sinus is there between the fox cerebrae and tenterum cerebellae? Straight sinus is there at the junction between the Fox cerebrae and tentorium cerebelli. Next question. Connecting vein between the facial vein and cavernous sinus is important question. It may help in the spread of infection from the dangerous area of face via facial vein to the cavernous sinus. That we discussed. The answer should be superior ophthalmic vein. It communicates the facial vein with the cavernous sinus. Next question. Internal carotid artery pierces the roof by passing between which and which process? Anterior and middle, middle and posterior, anterior and posterior, none. It is between anterior and middle clinal process. Anterior clinal process is a part of lacerating of spinoid, posteromedial margin. Middle clinal process is a part of tuberculum cellae, either side of tuberculum cellae. So that is my time with the dual analysis. Please excuse me for all those technical glitches. Hope you had a detailed understanding regarding dual venous sciences. If anything is missing, you are always welcome to add and improve this discussion. That's my time. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your time and effort for this wonderful presentation and lecture, sir. We are very glad and happy to attend this session. And uh, okay. we will be actually we'll be glad if you take such classes uh, even more frequently sir it's a humble yes ma'am yes, ma yeah. yes yes please it is not it is it is my duty 
if if somebody is listening to me i'm i'm more than happy to give my time and my effort and even i will improve myself so teaching is a great way of learning <laughs> thank you ma'am thank you yeah. for the opportunity thank you so and much sir and uh, thank you everyone who have joined us via zoom and youtube see you in the next